When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the law had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon, as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattitiah, Shema, Aniah, Uriah, Hilkiah, Maseah, and on his left were Pediah, Mishael, Malkijah, Hashum, Hashpadamah, Zechariah, and Meshulam. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, all the people stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Amen. And then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sheribiah, Yamin, Akub, Shabbatiah, Hodiah, Messiah, Keita, Azerah, Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people in the law while the people were standing there. They read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Just a bit of a reminder at the beginning of this. The feasts of Israel are a God-given gift to his people. They are markers within the year, helping to give to people a sense of their identity with God, particularly God's faithful purposes and provision and redemption. So as the people travel through the year, these festivals connect them to what God has done, what God is doing, and what God will do. And in the same way, as Christians, we have certain events which we remember and we celebrate throughout the year. And they help us to engage with what God has done, is doing, and will do. And as we heard from uh, the talk to our, our young people, uh, often these events are given to us to help us to remember. We remember our birthdays, we remember special events. I think last time I was here, uh, you had a, a wedding anniversary here, 60 diamond wedding anniversary. And you remember in order to honor. And there's always this connection in the Bible between remembrance and honoring. Um, so remembering is not simply nostalgia. Wasn't it good when this happened? Wasn't it good back in those days? Nostalgia is not really what the Bible is concerned about. The Bible is concerned about people remembering in order that they honor God. We remember in order to say, Lord, you have done this in the past. Will you please come and be with us today in a special way? So remembrance is an act of asking God to come and minister to us today, to bless us today. So it um, uh, shouldn't surprise us that uh, Jesus says when we share bread and wine, we do this in remembrance of him. We do it to honor him. We do it to make real today what he has done for us in the past. So we're focusing on the Festival of Trumpets. In some Bibles you have the Festival of Shofar. So those names are interchangeable, Trumpets and Shofar. And it was a festival to mark the beginning of the new year. It marked a period of ten days leading up to the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, is regarded as the most holy day in the biblical calendar. And Paul will be coming to speak to us about Yom Kippur next session. 
And Leviticus 23, verse 23 says, On this special New Year Day, you are to blow the shofar, you are to blow the trumpets. And it's a time of prayer, it's a time of self-reflection, it's a time of focusing on the coming of God's kingdom and his future judgment. So all those elements are connected with the blowing of the trumpet. A time of focus, self-reflection, and particularly thinking about the kingdom and the coming of God's judgment. And when I read the Lord's Prayer in Luke, the short version of the Lord's Prayer in Luke 11, I saw a kind of connection between the prayer Jesus teaches us to pray and the festival of trumpets. If the festival of trumpets is about self-reflection, the coming judgment of God, seeking forgiveness, avoiding temptation. Interesting that Jesus said this in his prayer. When you pray, say this, Father, may your name be holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily needs and forgive us our sins as we ask to forgive everyone indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. I think there's a very interesting parallel between the Lord's Prayer and the events of the Feast of Trumpets at the beginning of the year. In Jewish customs, there's lots of different traditions around the Festival of Trumpets. Um, often, um, just like our birthdays, you would have a special sweet cake, often made with honey and apple. And um, it sounds quite good, doesn't it? And uh, uh, what a great party, blowing those horns and eating uh, sweet cakes together. I think I could sign up for that. And, um, and then there's also a tradition uh, and you see it today in many Orthodox Jewish communities, that on the festival of trumpets, people meet by a river or by the seaside. And um, that's really based on, on, the, uh, on the scripture in Micah, which talks about uh, Micah chapter 7, about the Lord casting our, si our sins into the deepest sea, so they will not be remembered anymore. And... Um, when I was uh, uh, traveling in Eastern Europe, I remember when I was in Riga in the Baltic States, I was there on, uh, on uh, uh, the Feast of Trumpets and a large Jewish community from Riga all gathered by the uh, river, the river, uh, the estuary of the river in Riga. And they were there casting uh, bits of paper into the, into the river as a, a sign of, of, of hoping that God would forgive them their sins. I found that, uh, very, very, very moving to, to, to witness that particular event um, in, in Riga with the Orthodox Jewish community. But as a believer in Jesus, we have an assurance based on something far greater than the hope that somehow the God would deal with our sins. We have the very strong assurance in Scripture that this, the price for our sin has already been paid. It's not a question of, 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 of hoping but it's a question of, of trusting and knowing in what God has done. Let me just read to you a couple of scriptures, which I'm sure you know well. This is what the Apostle John says to the early church. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out a liar, and his word is not in us. My children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an intercessor with the Father, the righteous Messiah Jesus. He is the atonement for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. And again in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, we have these wonderful words of assurance, which again are, are well known to us. Trustworthy is the same and deserving of complete acceptance. Jesus came into this world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost, writes Paul. So there's a custom of gathering by the river and casting your sin into the river or into the sea with the hope of God forgiving you. But how can you be sure? The New Testament tells us how we can be sure, because we know the price has been fully paid by the person and work of Jesus. 
So we have our festival of trumpets rooted in that New Year event, which marks this time of reflection leading off to Yom Kippur. It's a time when Jewish people will consider their own lives and their hope and need for forgiveness. And uh, again, as, as Christians, we have an opportunity to share into that the good news of Jesus and what he has done. And then we're going to look at three readings just to draw this to a close this morning. And in each of these readings, the trumpet is, is being blown as a sign that God is restoring certain aspects of the nation and of people. So the Festival of the Trumpet is about a time of restoration. And we had that wonderful reading from Nehemiah at the, a few minutes ago. It was a reading of the book of the law, which had been lost for generations. So as the people returned to uh, Jerusalem and, and rebuilt the city and, set, and then rebuilt the temple, um, they were without the guidance of God's word. But then they found the word of God and it was being read to them publicly. This took place in the year 458 BC. And the trumpet was blown and it marks the restoration of a nation and the restoration of God's word, God's law, God's Torah. And uh, if you continue to read in Nehemiah 8, you'll have that great sense of restoration, proclamation, and of joy. And the trumpet, the shofars were blown throughout the city. So God is in the process of restoring a nation, restoring his word, uh, restoring a people. But God also works restoring individuals. And um, I've had the privilege of traveling uh, in Israel many, many times. And I have a favorite place in Israel. I'm not really sure if you're allowed to have a favorite place. Or, you know, well, it'd be like somebody say, have you got a favorite part of the Bible? I mean, you say, well, it's all good, isn't it? But <laughs> maybe you have a favorite part. And th this, is, this is my favorite part in Israel. It's a place called Kirsi up on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee. And... Um, if you know the story of when the, the demon, the, the, the man with demons was, was set free and the pigs ran into the sea, it's in Luke chapter 8. That is set at the place of Curtsy uh, in, in North Galilee. And um, at the end of that wonderful story, we, we hear that Jesus uh, delivers the man from the sins. And it says there that the man was sitting at the, at, at the feet of Jesus in his right mind. And the man had been fully restored. I mean, the man who was nameless, the man who was naked, the man who had completely disconnected himself from his community, meets with Jesus and he is delivered and is fully <laughs> restored. So God is in the, the process of restoring nations, Nehemiah chapter 8, restoring individuals, even the most broken and the most desperate are restored. And we have a wonderful story in Luke 8. If we have more time, I'd love to go through that with you in a bit more detail. But it's a wonderful story of deliverance and restoration. And then the final reading is in 1 Corinthians 15. Again, notice uh, the blowing of the trumpet. Let me just read this to you in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 to 58. Now I make known to you, brothers and sisters, the good news which I proclaim to you. You also received it, and you took it, and you took your stand upon it. And by it you are being saved, if you hold firm to the word I proclaim to you, unless you believe without proper consideration. For I also pass on to you, first of all, what was received. That the Messiah died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he, on the third day he, he rose again. So here Peter begins to talk about the victory of the resurrection. And there's that wonderful passage beginning with those well-known words. And we, and we go through the journey of the story of the resurrection. And then towards the end of that chapter, in verse 51, Paul then kind of changes theme a little bit and says, Behold, I tell you another mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, uh, at the last trumpet, the last shofar, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we will be changed. For the corruptible must put on incorruptibility and the mortal must put on immortality. 
when this corruptible will have put on, a, when will this corruptible put on our incorruptibility, and this mortality will have put on immortality. And then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? Now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who, keep, who keeps giving us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dearly loved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor, that, in, that your labor in the Lord is never in vain. Behold, I tell you a mystery, for the shofar will sound, and the dead will be raised. So this is the restoration, not simply of a nation, however wonderful that is, if you read about that in Nehemiah and Ezra. Not the restoration of individuals, however wonderful our own individual story is. That we all, if we're followers of Jesus, we all have a unique and precious testimony about God who is in the process of restoring broken people like you and me. But there's something bigger in Scripture than that. It's the final restoration of all things when the final trumpet, the final feast of trumpets will take place. And that is connected always in Scripture with the return of Jesus. And the focus is clearly on Jesus in this particular section in 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus. So we know in the first coming of Jesus, through his death and resurrection, and for the outpouring of his spirit, that we have a right relationship with God. And we rejoice in that. And that's why if you come to church, you'll find that community of people who are praising and, and, and thanking God for what he has done in Jesus. But, as Christians today, we still live in a broken world. We still live in a world where things are not how they should be. Um, we heard that reading about the terrible things our brothers and sisters in China are going through. I'm sure we could share some of the things which cause our own lives pain and sadness. In a community, this side is going to be some terrible experiences of bereavement and suffering because we're part of a broken world. And as Christians, we navigate, not always very well, between those two things. Yes, we know we have a God who saves and brings healing and victory. Yet we also know the brokenness of sin and the fragility of the world around us. How do we, how do we hold that together? But well, we hold it together by saying we look also to the second coming. The final story has not yet been told. We look to the first coming of Jesus, and that gives us great hope and joy and great faith. But a Christian faith doesn't simply rest by looking back to what God has done. There's also a future dimension. This is why when we share bread and wine, we talk about Christ has died and that Christ is risen. But we also say Christ will come again. So I think often in Christian theology, as we struggle with the complexities of life, often what is missing is a strong hope in the return of Jesus. I'm sure every church I've ever preached in longs to see the church grow. We want to be part of a growing church. We want to be part of a church in revival or renewal. We want more people to know the victory of Jesus. But the ultimate hope for the church is not in revival or renewal, or even in church growth. The ultimate hope is the return of Jesus. Amen. And one day, the final trumpet will be blown, and we will see that all is gathered in Christ. And all that which we don't understand, all the brokenness, all the if-onlys of our lives, will actually find healing and meaning when we have that final restoration in the person and work of Jesus. So be encouraged. We're part of something much bigger much bigger than ourselves, much bigger even in the church. We're part of the restoration of all things. And the festival of trumpets reminds us of the God who has restored. He's restored a nation. He's restored individuals. And one day, all things will be restored when the Messiah returns to rule and reign.